I was experiencing this deep loss of heart. Mm. Um, and, and the effect was what I kept saying to myself was, um, I just want to be done. I just mm. want to be done with my community. I just want to be done with my life with God. I just want to give up on all of it. But it was something in the heart of, I am so discouraged and at a loss of heart for this story, this life that I'm experiencing around me, and, and even my connection to God. Friends, welcome back to the Wild at Heart podcast here in the week of September 20th. John in the studio this week with two of my favorite people, John Dale, Alex Burton. Welcome, guys. Thanks, John. Good to be here. We are actually in part three of a four-part series here kind of through September. And so if you haven't listened to parts one and two, that this one's going to make a lot more sense if you go back, pick that up. But you don't have to. I think today's going to be awesome. But by way of review, to kind of pick up our listeners, we, we've been talking about a concern that we have for everyone's recovery, that the world that we have been living through in the last 16, 18 months has been a, a shared experience of global trauma. Hmm. You know, the uncertainty, the fear, the constant changing this, that, and then just all of the acrimony, the tensions around vaccines, yes. masks, like this, is, this has literally divided churches, right? which is so tragic. So everybody's a little beat up. And as Dan and I were talking about last week, we need to take a longer term view of our recovery. Hmm. And part of what we've experienced as a team and part of what we're concerned about is a, is a kind of vulnerability to then the enemy just jumping on. Mm. You know, he just always does that, right? Yeah. Dog pile. You know, you have a fight with your wife, you know, things don't go well with your teenage daughter, and then the enemy jumps in there and tries to really, you know, blow it all out of proportion, right? Yeah. Okay. So, um, have you guys seen those nature shows where they're doing like the annual caribou migration yeah. or the wildebeest, you know, making their trek across the Serengeti and you see the you see the vast panorama and the, you know thousands of animals going along and then the camera zooms in, right? As the narrator says, the injured wildebeest <laughs> is dangerously, you know, lingering behind the herd. Uh-huh. And like you know like what's coming next? Right. Q the lions. Yes. Right? <laughs> yeah, like I don't even need to watch the rest of the show. It's like, no, no, no. The right. baby caribou is dangerously behind the uh, her, you know. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Okay. So the pandemic put us all in, in in a heightened state of longing for life to be good again. And everybody rushed out during the summer, particularly of this year when there was, you know, m more freedom in most places in the world. Yes. To get out there. And like, you couldn't get a rental car. You couldn't mm -hmm. find a VRBO, mm -hmm. right? Do you remember, John, you and I were at this high mountain lake, Yeah, you and know, way up this four-wheel drive road. Yeah. Like, there's a lot of people. And then we both go on hikes to kind of get away. And we bump into each other. Yeah. In the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Which was kind of fun and very playful of God. But then we come back from this hike and this this beautiful remote lake. There's stand up paddle boarders, there's canoers, there's guys in float tubes. Oh wow. And the entire shoreline yeah. is practically lined with fishermen. And I'm yeah. like, wow. The whole world is out just looking for some joy. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. our concern is that, as Dan was describing last week, that's not gonna work. Mm-hmm. It's helpful. I hope everybody got some joy this summer, but it's not sufficient. It's inadequate to the healing of the human soul and to frankly strengthen us against some of the predatory forces that are out there in the world now wanting to take advantage of our vulnerability. 
things like discouragement and despair and, you know, hopelessness, that kind of stuff that just sweeps in when you're the limping <laughs> wildebeest, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. You guys both had a very important experience separate of one another mm. during the spring that neither of you knew about and I didn't know about. Right until you had kind of come through it. Mm. But I want to go back and pick up your stories because I think they'll be really helpful to our listeners in this week's podcast and next week's kind of where we're going to just strengthen people. So you got kind of clobbered. Uh (laughs) (laughs) Uh-huh. Describe that. Oh, man. Yeah. I I won't go into a lot of detail on why clobbered. But I will just say this, felt a bit like a perfect storm Mm. of circumstances in the world, circumstances in my personal life and family and friends and community um, and in in life with God, Mm. quite honestly. And... Now to explain the effect. So here, here's what I was experiencing. I was, I was experiencing this deep loss of heart, mm. um, and and the effect was what I kept saying to myself was, um, I just want to be done. I just mm. want to be done with my community. I just want to be done with my life with God. I just want to give up on all of it. And now these weren't just to clarify, these weren't suicidal thoughts. No, no, I wasn't I wasn't suicidal. I wasn't, you know, I wasn't gonna leave my wife. Yeah. You know, yeah. Any anything like that. But it, it was something in the heart. But it was something in the heart of I am I am so discouraged and and at a loss of heart for this story, this life that I'm experiencing around me, and and even my connection to God, like I, it just felt absence, this absence of God. Yes, and I couldn't hear His voice. Um, I wasn't experiencing Him. I was mostly discouraged and 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 had a loss of heart, quite frankly, around. The other believers around me, <laughs> um, maybe maybe the church in general, yeah, like okay. just discouraged with, and and I think a piece of that is where the culture is, and you, you even described it a little bit earlier of just the just the uh, fractures in relationships, and then yeah. you know people's opinions on this and yeah. that, and all these different things, but. But it was causing me to lose heart, and mm. and um, like for a weekend? No, no. Um, oh, I would I would say a good solid few weeks at least, maybe a little longer than that, if I'm honest. Yeah. Um, so, and so during a block of time in the spring, yeah, you're experiencing this. Where's God? Yeah. I'm not hearing him. Yeah. Don't know that I want to hear him. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And then quite honestly, a, a piece of me that was just fed up yeah. with God and with the whole story and that, all of it. <laughs> and and here I here I am, right? I'm like, I'm a, I'm a part of this global ministry. Like there's something deeply wrong with me is what I was feeling yes. in that. And how am I going to have this conversation with my buddies with John and JD and Morgan and explain to them that that all is lost, right? Yeah. Like it just felt that way. Yes. And um And we're we're laughing about it now yes. because you're on the other side of it. Exactly. But, but you wouldn't have been laughing about it then. No. No. We're, no. We're, it felt it felt very much like a crisis and one that yeah. that there wasn't a lot of hope for a way through it. Yeah. Is what I would say. Yeah, and I'm I'm really grateful you used the phrase "perfect storm." Yeah, because it's the convergence. Yeah, of vulnerabilities. Yep. Pandemic pressure, trauma, stuff, global, just mess. Right. You know, 
disappointment. Yeah. And and then the enemy gets in there somehow as well. Yeah. And it just turns into this experience that feels, I mean, it, it feels real. Yeah, it feels real and it feels like it's me. Yes. Right. And what's crazy is not long before that, John, you had something similar. Mm -hmm. I found myself coming into the end of last year, the end of 2020. Um, and, And usually for me, New Year's is a really like hopeful and life giving time. I have all these sort of end of year rituals that I go through reviewing the prior year. And I found myself in the Christmas holidays and coming into the new year. At that point, what I would just describe as being kind of in a funk. And every time I would sit down to do my sort of prior year review process, which normally I love, I was not finding any joy in it. Mm-hmm. And, and at first I thought, okay, this isn't a big deal. We're in the middle of COVID craziness. Like I'm going to be okay soon. And then the weeks went by and it was becoming months. Mm. And the only way I can describe it is I just was not myself. Mm. Like I literally found myself, if I looked at my calendar and I had a meeting on my calendar that was sort of dependent on me, the, the kind of meeting that normally I might thrive in, I would dread going to work that day. Oh, wow. I mean, I would find myself what I'd describe as like severely diminished capacity. Yes. Um, inability to focus on things, find, finding myself forgetting things. Um, I, I had one day, which, which it's funny to look back on because it doesn't seem like that big of a deal, but I had a day where I got to the office and realized, oh, I don't have my wallet. And it was not a big deal. I called my son and was asked him to bring it in to me. Two days later, the exact same thing happened. And you know how it is. Like as guys, we walk out the door, it's like pocket checks, keys, wallet, phone. Mm-hmm. Like those are the three <laughs> items we need to survive the day, right? And, and so I, I just found myself over and over again in these situations that were really scary. And... In the midst of that, like you described, Alex, what started happening was this really deep questioning of God. And to be honest, like a questioning of, of like God's existence. I, I, I literally found myself mm-hmm. sitting there thinking through, you know, having thoughts like, well, maybe maybe God isn't real. And maybe this whole thing that I've kind of given my life to, you know, is a story that we've made up and I can't believe that I've fallen into this. Mm. And like, how am I going to tell my wife and kids that I don't (laughs) believe in God anymore? And what are the implications for my future and my career? And and it, like, it was, it was really interesting how, how quickly it spiraled to a pretty dark place. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you for coming in today to talk about this because I can feel the number of people that are like, wait, what? Yeah. Like I thought it was just me. Yeah. And, and, you know, anyone who's tracked with our ministry for any amount of time knows you guys and knows you to be solid and deep and loving and, strong in Christ. And they're like, wait, what? John? Alex? Wait a second. Like, And personally, I've been all over the world with you guys. We yes. have been in some gnarly, <laughs> right, gnarly spiritual situations, yeah. and you've been strong. Yeah. You've been good. Like, like, yeah. come through it well. Come through it thriving. So it's like, wait a second. Yeah. And th- this really got my attention. And, yeah. and this was actually part of the genesis of this podcast series, actually, mm-hmm. was when I heard your stories, and we're going to get back to it in a minute, of kind of like, well, well wait a second, how did God come? Yeah, that's the point of today's podcast. But but we're telling a story. When I heard your stories, like, hold on a second. These are 
warning signs of something more significant going on, I think, in the world mm -hmm. and in the, the body of, of Jesus's friends. And here's what got me initially like, wait a second. At the same time, in the spring, Stacy and I had individually been in some pretty difficult, almost heartbreaking conversations with dear, dear friends who were giving up on God in various forms and various ways. And there's always a story. There's a story behind it, a difficult marriage, you know, a moral failure, da, 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 da. you know, there's, there's stuff, right? There's, yeah. But what we were seeing was this commonality of really strong saints that they weren't like your average sort of Sunday going Christian. These were people who love God deeply mm -hmm. and had a life in him for years falling kind of away, choosing other than God. Yeah. To, and, and like, wait a second, wait a second. So what I want to do in this series and what I want to do a little bit today is to try and explain the storm and how to get out of it. Because it is a storm. There's vulnerabilities, there's the enemy, there's what's going on in the world. Yeah. It's all converging. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, Paul apparently had a long conversation, kind of a running conversation going on with the church in Thessalonica about the return of Jesus. And there were questions and concerns, and there were people you know, saying some pretty weird stuff. One of the weird things was that it had already happened. Christ had already come back. And, and he's, Paul's like, what? Like, that's crazy. And so he's writing in both epistles, the first and second letter that we have to the church there. And one of the things he says is, let no one deceive you. He says, the, that day, meaning the, the day of Jesus' return, will not come unless the falling away comes first. Mm. So that's Second Thessalonians chapter 2 verse three. And I think the New Living Translation has it, for the Lord will not come again until many people turn away from God. Because yeah, the, yes, the Greek word is apostasy, apostasy, and you kind of go, and then you, you, yeah. you get the zombie apocalypse stuff, right? You're right. thinking, whoa, there's going to be people marching in the streets, you know, tattooing, I hate Jesus on their chests or whatever, and you know, <laughs> tens of thousands. But I was listening to it Another uh, teacher on this, the Naked Bible podcast, Michael Heiser's uh, show, and he was saying that he didn't think that that's what the word means. He didn't think that's what we should look for, that that's what we'll see. He's, he, he literally said, I just think a lot of people are going to give up on God mm, yeah, because of disappointment. And I'm like, wait a second, like that was Alex, like that was, John. whoa, hang on. This seems to be going on. Yeah. Mm. Have you seen it? Mm hmm Yeah. I mean, um, I won't give any specifics on people, but but yeah, I've encountered conversations with others where they are deeply questioning what they have held dearly for decades yeah. in their life. And it's and it's so subtle because it's not it's not some big it's not some big event or some big revelation. Exactly. It's this attrition of things and and quite honestly the assault of like I was describing of of going, man, this just isn't worth it anymore. And yeah. and people like I was describing, losing heart. Yeah, mm. yeah, and it's the it's the intersection or the convergence of genuine disappointments, genuine vulnerabilities in us, mm -hmm. including the shared vulnerability we all have from the pandemic. I mean, we're still limping from that. Right. The soul has not recovered from that. And then, when you put the human soul through serial disappointment. And I just heard a few more this week of friends who've, you know, pulling their daughter out of ballet class because she, her body actually hasn't recovered from COVID. And it's just, mm. it's loss mm. after loss after loss. And um, we weren't exactly strong 
coming into 2020. Yeah. <laughs> like yeah. get your life back and all that stuff about soul care. That was written before mm -hmm. the pandemic. Mm -hmm. Okay. So you so you have you know, a vulnerability and then we get clobbered by serial disappointment and, and loss and tragedy and all that. And it's still going on. And then, you know, we rush out to try and get some relief for that. And that relief doesn't end up working. Mm -hmm. That's what I'm really concerned about is people move into the fall, go back to work. They don't have any more vacation time. And now what? Now what do I do? Right. So this really got our attention because Paul does talk about, hey, you know, as things accelerate towards the wonderful day of Jesus' return, you are going to see quite a number of people just giving up on God. Mm -hmm. You know, it's out of disappointment. And, and so you experienced it. We're watching it happen. I've gotten clobbered by this thing in myself and the temptation through it. I had, had a couple things happen this summer that were so profoundly disappointing, like really, really deep, almost at the level of personal trauma. Yeah. And a real blow directly against my life with God. Mm -hmm. Like, wait, I thought I heard you, God. And then things going deeply wrong. And I could feel the hot breath of the enemy there wanting me to just make choices against God. Like, mm. I don't trust you, I don't like you, I'm done. Yes. I'm done. Yeah. And weren't you writing your letter of resignation in your head? <laughs> <laughs> yes, I never but actually put it to paper. Good. But yes, I yeah. was I was evaluating how do I how do I describe this to these guys? Yeah. So wanting very much to give our our audience a full understanding there are real vulnerabilities. And we're going to get back to your stories in just a minute. But Scripture makes it very clear. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. There, there are spiritual forces that try and maximize these opportunities, right? Yeah. And so hatred would be an example. I mean, just good grief, the presidential election that we just went through and social media. And like, you can't say anything that has any sort of opinion yep. on, on social media without somebody jumping all over it and just chewing your butt off for that. Mm -hmm. Like there's a lot of hatred out there in the world. I think part of it is beat up humanity. People just, you know, people who don't have much left in the tank don't behave very well. <laughs> <laughs> But then there's the gasoline, then the, then there's the spirit of hatred egging everybody on, yeah, right? As, right? As a way of example. Yeah. So Daniel, Jesus, and Paul all talk about a figure that they call desolation coming in to do harm at the end of the age. And, mm. and we don't need to get into like the Antichrist and the beast and da-da-da-da-da-da-da, but just say there is this figure that brings about desolation. Daniel names it, Jesus quotes him, Paul refers to it in that Thessalonians chapter, Second Thessalonians chapter. And what's really fascinating about this is I would call what we are seeing trying to come against our hearts a kind of desolation. Mm -hmm. There's a barrenness, there's a bereftness, there, God's not speaking, I don't care. I, Right, like yep. the, call, you call it a funk, but over time the funk just becomes desolate. Yeah, I mean, it's it was for me. I didn't remember the last time I'd felt happy. Wow. Right, and that that's exactly what you're describing. Right, and when you take an experience of serial disappointments like the pandemic, and you know the loss, for example, of the t of taste and smell that does yeah. not come back. Mm. For people, you know, some people I know yet for a year, mm -hmm. like, and, and it just, that's just so vulnerable to robbery, thievery, wow, I'm never going to get that back. There's nothing to look forward to, desolation. Mm -hmm. So we don't have to get tangled up in, you know, antichrist theology. We can just say we are warned about desolation trying to get in. And what's interesting is it says he will, he will, 
he will try and, and enter the temple. He will take over the temple. And the, so the classic evangelical theology is, oh, well then, you know, the Dome of the Rock has to get blown up, you know, yes. uh, in Jerusalem, <laughs> and then they're going to rebuild the temple, and they're going to start the sacrificial system again, and then desolation will show up. And I'm like, people, did you read the New Testament? Yeah. The location of the temple has changed. The temple is now the heart of the believer. Mm -hmm. It's just very clear. Paul mm -hmm. says, do you not know that you are the temple of God? Yeah. Okay. And that's what I was seeing. So just kind of like, you know, from a therapist worldview and mindset, I'm watching friends, family, clients, people, and, and I'm seeing this desolation thing get in through our vulnerabilities, through totally legitimate disappointments. I'm yeah. not I'm not making little even of the trauma I suffered this summer. It was heartbreaking. Right. But then this guy tries to jump in. And and what we want to do is just help strengthen people's hearts around all that. Like you know, and what Dan was warning about last week is hey, can we just take a little longer view of our recovery here? Like mm -hmm. don't put everything on summer. Or then you'll be desolate, yeah. Because summer's over and it didn't do everything you needed it to do, right? Yeah. Replenishing reserves actually takes quite a long time, and so what I was trying to do with Dan, what I want to do with you this week is helping people be aware. Oh man, right? That thing that wants me to give up, give up on God, that kind of bereft desolate thing. I think some of the symptoms are like a blankness of heart, a poverty of spirit, a barrenness of soul, just feeling bereft, yeah. right? The emptiness of it. It's not traumatic, it doesn't, but, but it's awful. Mm -hmm. it, 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 and joy doesn't come light and easy. Mm -hmm. John, you were wondering, when was the last time I was happy? Um, but most importantly, it's a kind of blankness mm -hmm. in our life with God. It's like faith feels like yesterday. Mm -hmm. I mean, that was that was somewhere in my past. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Wasn't it, does that describe your symptoms? Yeah, I think so. Um very much that um a hopelessness yeah. in my faith. Yes. Mm -hmm. You know, yes. where as JD was describing going Maybe I just deluded myself. Maybe I like this deep questioning. Yes. Of what have I been thinking? And yeah. all the things that used to be these deep held beliefs that, you know, are like a rock. Yes. Felt like they're gone. And so all the questioning, yes. you know, rushed in at that point. And yeah. Yeah. So this is strong stuff. It really is, gang, because if if someone like you guys, me this summer, others, you know, if, if we're getting hammered by this, it's like, whoa, wait a second, you know, we've given everything for this. We mm -hmm. have a long history with God. We've got lots of stories of his faithfulness, you know, that so for this to get in is sounding the alarm for us here and we're praying a lot about it, being intentional. Uh, to strengthen ourselves against it. So let's go back into your stories now because we are on the other side yeah. of it. And what would you say was the vulnerability and what got you through? Like what those two things, what was the vulnerability and what, what helped get you out from under this cloud? Mm. Well, one of the pressures of this was I didn't feel like I could talk with anyone else about what was going on, mm -hmm. right? So there was this isolation, there was this aloneness that just made things worse. And one of the things that was the starting point of the breakthrough for me was when I got honest with some of my close friends. When I, when I talked with you and yeah. you right. and a couple of other people in, in, in my life and told them, yep this is what I am experiencing. And there was something about just that process of, of casting light on it, admitting where I was, that really began the process of healing. Mm -hmm. Now there was, you know, for, for me, there were some vulnerabilities that had been there for a long time. I went into a season of counseling 
um, and, and worked with a counselor and did some pieces of my story. But the, that initial just inviting light into my life, yeah. um, that for me was the beginning. Mm. Mm. And, and there were unhealed emotional wounds, mm -hmm. issues, history. Yep. That was also part of the vulnerability. Yeah, absolutely. As I began to dig in with a counselor into my story, things came to light that God wanted to go after. Yes. Yeah. And and that's a really hopeful part of this game. Right. Because I've also found him doing that. Mm -hmm. he, he seemed, God seems to be really committed in the last several years uh -huh. in the life of everyone I know. Yeah. Of that process of, hey, can I raise this thing that you haven't let into the light of day? Hey, can I bring yeah. love into, hey, would you see a counselor? Would you, you know, a, a, it feels like he's been more intentional about our healing. Right. And what was clearly the, the attack of the enemy that he meant for evil and was trying to get me literally to like disavow my faith God turned around and used to go after some deep-rooted shame and some other things yes. that, while I don't want to go back to where I was a year ago or mm. earlier this year, no, um, I am really grateful for the healing, for the restoration, for the breakthrough yes. that has come because of the place of despair that I was driven to. Yeah, yeah, and the healing helps to shore up and, and close off the vulnerabilities right, right. so that the perfect storm can't clobber us, yeah. right? That's, that's what we're after. So that was, that was huge for, for what he brought for you. Yeah. Yeah. What about for you, Alex? What was the vulnerability and what yeah. brought change? Yeah, I'd say two, two things that um, similarly to John, Isolation was one of the pieces, and un unfortunately, you know, when when it kicked off in me, my reaction was to isolate because what the heck's going on? Yeah, and I got to figure this out, and something's wrong here, and 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 I was isolated, and it was not good mm. um, because it continued to just perpetuate mm. the. Mm. The process and isolation was a vulnerability. I'd say depletion was mm. a big vulnerability in this, and and the whole world's depleted right right now um, as we've as we've come out of this. And I think one of the things that was really helpful when we got together on this, John and and JD and and I stopped isolating and said, hey, I'm not doing well. And here's what's going on in my head and in my heart on this. And uh, John, you you um, brought up what you and Dan talked about in the previous podcast uh, with us as a team saying, gang, you need to understand that recovery from this is going to take a while and be kind to yourselves Yes, and realize that that's, that's a process over time and it's okay, but take it seriously. And and I think I was a little bit just naive of, you know, yeah, but it's summer and it's all gonna be okay. And, you know, I'm gonna go to the river with my family and we're gonna have fun. And like, <laughs> yep. I'm, a, I'm a hobbit, man. I just, I want my pint of beer and, you know. Yeah. Joy. We all and, want back in the Shire. And it's so not sufficient yes. for what we need. And uh, I think the depletion, the isolation, it just allowed then the circumstances and like I said, the perfect storm of things. And John, you described some very, you know, some real personal disappointments and yep. hurts that have that happened this summer for you. I had some similar things um, for myself that they weren't necessarily new to me, but they were pretty big slaps in the face mm. of pain in my story, in my history, that 
also conspired against me and gave the enemy this really strong foothold yes. to bring in some of that stuff and go, yeah, look, see, yeah. see, it's all, yes. it's all crap. It's all yes. not worth it. And yeah, brought me to that pretty dark place. And then you made a choice. Yeah, that was a big piece for me coming to a decision point of what am I going to choose? Am I going to choose to continue to go with this train of thought and where I'm headed with it? Or am I going to choose God? And um, it was funny. This summer we we watched the movie Rudy as a family. Oh, my, yeah. My son is starting football for the first time and He's not the fastest kid on the team, I would say, um, but he's got a lot of heart and he's going after it and uh, he's learning. And so we thought, oh, Rudy's a great movie. Maybe that'll you know, inspire him for the season. And so we're watching Rudy and I was just struck by Rudy's talking to the old priest, right? Um, and and he's pretty discouraged about, I'll never get into Notre Dame and that maybe this isn't going to happen. And the, and he's asking the priest, like, can you give me the answer to all this? And the priest goes, Rudy, I only know two things for sure. And one is God exists and I'm not him. And it was funny because it was it was reminding me of the moment where I kind of made a choice of, God, I, I need you. I choose you. And I'm not going to take the bait. And I'm not you, right? Yeah. Because they're... I think there was this other sinister piece in it of the enemy kind of baiting you to to live the self life mm -hmm. to to try to figure this thing out mm -hmm. myself right yep. and so to have the humility right to step back and go I'm not God yes I believe you are God yes and I need you yes. and I choose you yes and that was enough of a crack in the door to then begin to get some breakthrough, be able to pray again with some counsel from you and others and to stop isolating and to, yes. and to then see the warfare for the warfare in it and see the reality of painful things that do need healing mm -hmm. and do need addressed and yep. come out of it. So, Friends, part of the reason that we ran the series we did in July on attachment to God is because it is one of the greatest antidotes to what we're describing. Mm -hmm. If there are places in us that feel bereft mm -hmm. because of our story, if there's places in us that do feel desolate, oh man, yeah. like it's too vulnerable in this hour because yeah. of these characters on the stage now, attachment to God, inviting mm -hmm. God in, a union, nourishment, love. I'm going to just recommend that three-part series in July that Morgan and Sherry did. That, that wasn't an isolated drop-in. <laughs> that, that, was, that was one of our offerings to help our listeners fortress ourselves against this perfect storm. Mm -hmm. So choosing for God, being aware that we're being hard pressed to choose against God, to, to yeah. just give up, to, to walk away. And then to be aware of there is desolation in the world, mm -hmm. like, like fear. Fear rolled in. Right. And, and we could all look at that and go, whoa, you know, yes, there was reason for concern, but fear just overwhelmed people's rationality, you yeah. know. And, and so that's a spirit, that's warfare, that's a piece of it that took the opportunity of the vulnerability of the pandemic, right? Yep. Fear just rolled through. Yep. Um, and we've got two type of drivers in our neighborhood now. We've got the, the timid Timothys, and they, <laughs> they are driving like 10 miles under the speed limit. They wait forever at stop sites. Like you can tell, this is a, this is a fearful person. Yeah. And what began as concern of, of, a, of an illness has now spread into fear in their whole life, right? Or you've got the ragers. <laughs> and the <laughs> ragers are going 20 miles over, and they're just pissed. And that's, that's a trauma response. Both of those things are trauma responses. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I want to add one more thing to our conversation today, and then we'll pick up with this again next week. 
if you think of desolation as like a desert, it just wants to make everything barren. Hope is barren. Joy is barren. I just think of, you know, the losses and the weddings that didn't get to happen during the pandemic mm -hmm. and the school classes and all. There was just a barrenness that came into our lot. Can't travel, can't get together, can't have small groups, can't, you know, it's just a barrenness. It's just emptiness. That's, that's desolation. It wants to make everything a desert. Well, then what's God's provision? What's the opposite? Well, the opposite is Eden. Mm -hmm. The opposite is life and lushness and everything growing and everything thriving and just the power of God to do that. So the wedding at Cana, Jesus takes water, turns it into very excellent wine, mm -hmm. 180 gallons of it. And here's what it says. It says, he thus revealed his glory mm -hmm. and his disciples put their trust in him. Mm -hmm. So the glory of God is what produces Eden. The glory of God is what produced the wine at Cana. And what's fascinating is in Romans 6, it says that the Father raised Jesus from the dead through his glory. Mm -hmm. So glory is used a lot of different ways in the, in, the, in the Old and New Testaments, but one of the ways is it is the generative, lush, verdant, you know, life-giving power of God. It can raise people from the dead. It can create an Eden yeah. yeah, it can produce, mm -hmm. you know, wine from water. It's glory, like the generative glory of God. And we found it very helpful to pray that, to invoke the Eden glory of God in our homes and in our lives and around us as a shield in in this hour against desolation. Yeah. Because and part of this is just, I'm just mercy, because you can't you can't go back and 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 shore up every single vulnerability in your life. Yeah. Like that that'll just get you chasing your tail. Yeah. Yes, pay attention to your pain. Yes, God will raise things that he wants to bring attachment to or love or healing. Yes, yes, yes. But in the meantime, <laughs> yeah. We as a team have been using the idea of, okay, desolation, desert, Eden, glory. Let's, let's invoke the glory of God as our shield in this hour against desolation. And it's been very helpful. Mm -hmm. Wouldn't you say? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, John, I, um, like I was saying before, when I finally made that choice and, and then was able to get some counsel and to understand the bigger picture of what was happening that, you know, it's not just you, like, because that yes. was the other piece of this thing, right? Is it fe totally feels like it's just you and you have all the evidence and you have all the circumstance that supports it and tells you, yeah, you really should give up. And so to then make the stand and the choice of, no, I choose you, God, and now to begin to pray and and enforce the glory of God as our shield has had a massive effect. It's helpful, gang. It really is. And so um, I want to just recommend everybody tries it. G give it a week. Um, like you don't have to just take our word for it. Like give it a week. But here's how it goes. We're going to pray together here as, as we wrap up episode three. And we'll be back next week uh, with the final part of this series. But the prayer is this, I choose you, God. I choose you. I bring the Eden glory of God against all desolation in my life. I pray that your glory, God, your life-giving, beautiful, lush, Eden-creating glory resurrecting power would fill my life, mm -hmm. would fill my vulnerabilities, would permeate me, but also shield me against desolation in this hour on the earth mm -hmm. and, and the falling away and the giving up. And pray the glory of God to shield our homes and our households. Mm -hmm. We pray your Eden glory both as our refuge and our shield yeah. Yeah, at this God. time in this perfect storm. And we pray 
for your love yes. and for your hope mm. to come into the places in us that have been so beat up. Mm -hmm. And we need strength. Mm. We pray for strength and we pray for the glory of God as our shield. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Amen.